righty. Can everyone hear me? I'm talking like a rapper. Is this working? Okay. So tonight I want to talk about building applications like Google using containers, Kubernetes, and Mesos. So just a quick show of hands. Who here knows what Kubernetes is? All right. Who here knows what Mesos is? I want more hands, damn it. <laughs> anyway. So when we hear the term cloud, it's kind of overused. Like, you know, everyone has their own interpretation of what it means. You're starting to see it in popular uh, marketing. And you know, it could mean anywhere from AWS to Joyent to OpenStack to you know, everything in between. And we, when we talk about containers, uh, Docker has really been popularized quite a bit lately, but they've been around for a while. Um, we've had pretty good container technology with Sun back in 2005 with the you know, Solaris zones. But it's more than just a sandbox, but it's a little bit less than a VM. And traditionally, it's a pretty lightweight Linux environment. It's hermetically sealed, deployable system. It's introspectable, and it's a runnable artifact. So why should developers care? Like Static application environments, reliable deployments, no stress, deploy no stress deployments and updates. It's repeatable, uh, runnable artifact, so it's really portable. So you can de develop it on your laptop, you know, run it anywhere that you want, and loosely coupled, so it's easier to build and manage. You can compose applications from microservices and mix and extend third-party services. So what we're really trying to do is keep programs simple and prefer to build smaller stateless programs. So when I look at this you know, typical uh, row in a data center, I really have no sense of what is running on those machines, right? Like at best, I have some blinking lights, and I know like, yeah, something's probably happening. It's blinking. So when I look at the you know, whole cluster, I want to know what's running where and, and what it's doing and what resources it's using. And in a typical 2,000 machine cluster, you'll have you know, more than 10 machine crashes per day. And that could be anything from a power supply failing, you know, um, just a disk failure, you know, something to cause it to go down. So you see, you know, RAM failures, that's your averages, disk failures, averages, machine crashes, approximately, you know, two a year, OS upgrades not working. Um, especially when you get in a world like Core OS where it can do things in the background, you think everything's great, you go to flip over to the update and things don't work as expected. So I'm trying to use a different slide deck so I might not get through all of this, but basically you know, talking about hardware, containers, cluster management, container management, and platform stacks for large distributed apps. And how do you get started? So on Google Compute Engine, you know, you have VMs as a service. It's available in a lot of different availability zones. You've got Europe, Asia, US. You can do live migrations. But the problems with raw VMs is they're expensive to turn up. It takes a lot of time for the hypervisor to you know, kick in for the whole system to boot in, on top of that. And it's hard to make repeatable because you actually do have a whole system booting on top of a hypervisor. There can be things that can go wrong during that sequence that you just wouldn't expect, like bringing up a networking stack and you've had a problem with your DHCP server if you're relying on DHCP, and now that machine doesn't boot. And it's really difficult to replicate locally if you don't have the exact same underlying hardware that's being abstracted with that hypervisor. And there's a high possibility of failure. With container technology, it's lightweight Linux execution environment. You can use things like libcontainer from the folks at Docker, LXC, you know, let me containerize that for you, which by far is my favorite name that Google came up with because everything should be named that way. Uh, I love seeing a manager look at that and be like, uh, are we running that LMT5 thing? It's like, no, no, we're not. So static application composition, and you have a reliable deployments. And it's really a unit of resource isolation. So you can do multi-tenancy without heavyweight VMs. So Docker, you know, who here uses Docker on a daily basis? Really, that's it? OK. Who here uses VMs on a daily basis, but not for production, like for development? OK. Pretty evenly weighted. Um, so Docker's open source. It's configurable layers. It's reproducible. It's version controlled. And you know, lots and lots of other people have containers available at the Docker registry. So you can pretty much find whatever you want you know, as, a doc as a Docker image. And in today's world, you can run everything in, you know, in containers pretty much, except for some proprietary software that they don't want you to 
running containers. So with Mesos, we support Docker. It's a first-class citizen. You know, you can scale up to 10,000 plus nodes easily. Like if you take Twitter, for example, all new development at Twitter is run on top of Mesos, and you're looking at like, you know, 100,000 plus cores. It's a top-level Apache project, just like Hadoop. Uh, it's used by Twitter, Airbnb, uh, Netflix, you name it. There's a ton of people using it. And there's APIs for C++, Python, JVM languages, Go, obviously. And it's pluggable. There's CPU, memory, and I.O. isolation. And it's built on top of the C group support in Linux. So you, know, you have everything that you can do with C groups available to you in Mesos. And it's highly configurable uh, with pretty easy to use defaults. You can def you know, install a default package, get up and running, and you can also customize and, and do your own custom frameworks. And at Mesosphere, we are the company behind Apache Mesos. Um, we have the, you know, Ben Hinman, who's the creator, you know, working as our chief architect, and uh, pretty much the majority of the committers on the project outside of Twitter. And we are building packages and support structure for people to run, you know, Mesos on their own on-premise cluster. And so I just want to run through quickly how Mesos works. You've got your know, application layer and your framework and a Mesos master and a Mesos slave. So on the Mesos slave is where the execution actually runs, where your tasks actually, oh, I, I couldn't be a wrapper there for a second. So it's where your tasks actually run. Um, and you can see that there's one outside dependency on Zookeeper, and that's basically just for the master and the, and the standbys to decide you know, who is the primary master at that time. One interesting thing about how the Meso slaves work is the slave process running on those boxes, it can die, and all of your tasks stay running. As soon as you respawn a new master, I mean, a new uh, slave process, it just re-registers all of those tasks that are running. And if anyone's ever tried to do Docker at scale, if the Docker daemon dies, you lose all of your Docker containers, and this is a nice way using our Docker containerizer to avoid that. Uh, we're working, it's not released. I'll use my safe harbor air quotes here. Uh, we have a new version of our Docker containerizer that will uh, break away from that Docker daemon dependency. So with Kubernetes, you, you know, it pretty much uses Docker right now as for the container format, format, and they promote that. It's simple, portable, extensible, modular. Um, it's a framework for container-based services and app management, and it's packed after internal systems in Google that manage internet scale workloads, and it's written in Go. So who here has looked at the code behind Kubernetes? Did you like it? For the most part, good stuff. So I just briefly wanted to touch on this slide. This is how uh, Kubernetes can run on top of Mesos. So things are broke up you know, a little bit so that we can have the uh, Scheduler running on top of the Mesos master as a top level application, and the executor then calling into the. Let's, this mic keeps going out. Sorry. So, just a glossary of terms in Kubernetes. We have the master, so the managing machine which oversees one or more minions. I love that they use the term minion. I wish with Mesos we used minion instead of slave. It sounds so less demeaning. Um, <laughs> so, a minion, a minion is a slave that runs task is delegated by the user in the Kubernetes master, and a pod is an application that runs on a minion. So the replication controller verifies everything that should be running, is running, and then the label is an arbitrary key value pair uh, that the replication controller uses for service discovery. So these, in Kubernetes, the labels are really powerful. You can use that you know, uh, to do some really interesting things uh, for labeling all of your, your different infrastructure. And then you have the, the cube config tool for configuration and the, the service, which is you know, an amalgamation of similar pods. So this slide's not the easiest to read, but you can kind of get the basic overview of how things work. Uh, you have the REST API. Everything's pretty easy to program to. You, it's pretty extensible. Um, on the minion level, having C-Advisor to actually be able to get stats back about what's going uh, is a pretty powerful tool. And the connection points with Kubernetes running on Mesos is that Kubernetes pods is basically a Mesos task group. The pod labels are Mesos task group labels and task labels. And label selectors are the, you know, using the Mesos label service. And 
I don't know why that looks so weird. The replication controller is just Marathon, which is basically the uh, the scheduling component for Mesos, where you decide to kick off your new tasks and, and size them and set their configurations. And the Kubernetes service is just the Marathon service discovery. So this slide's showing the Mesos framework overview uh, with Kubernetes. and. Uh, kind of color-coded. I don't know how well you can see that on this one. but So you can see that the Meso slave actually has the kubelet and the, the pods. So those are the different containers that are running there. And um, you have different executors, like the Mesos executor, and here we have a Sparks ex executor. And what's really interesting about if you, had, if you had an existing Mesos cluster and you were going to also try out Kubernetes, you can have Marathon you know, side by side. Uh, with Kubernetes, you can have Spark, you can run everything on one cluster. And at Mesosphere, what we're really trying to push is that you know, your whole entire you know, data center acts like just one compute resource. So one of the really exciting things that we've been working on is uh, implementing Yarn as a Mesos framework. So it, we'll make an announcement late, probably early next month about that. It's in partnership with uh, some big names that everyone in the room's heard of. So now you can pretty much run everything that you would ever want to do, and, you know, be it a Spark job, be it you know, um, trying to emulate your GC environment on premise, all on your same cluster. So this is kind of a breakdown of how the Mesos master and scheduler works. So you can coexist with your current Mesos framework. So uh, who here has used Kronos before? Anyone? That one guy. Awesome. You want a job? <laughs> So <laughs> Kronos is the distributed cron. So you, you know, most environments you end up seeing you know, pretty ridiculous setups where you have one box that's named like cron1. You know, like you take Airbnb, for example. Uh, back in their legacy pre-Mesos days, they had two boxes, one named cron1, one, one, one named cron2. And when a new developer would be hired, they'd go in, add their job, everything was great. Their editor would be configured to remove blank lines, and they would screw up the whole cron tab because they didn't realize there had to be a blank line at the bottom, and the job that was supposed to run on a Monday night didn't run at all, and nothing got updated, and it was a pain. So the people at Airbnb started to make a project called Kronos, which runs on top of Mesos, and actually just you know uses the whole cluster to make sure that your jobs are scheduled and, and run on time. And the uh, the Mesos master has a, an interesting concept to, for fairness. So it's DRF-based, so dominant resource fairness between frameworks. So it's as the frameworks are written, they uh, actually have weights applied to them so that you can make sure that you know, your things run uh, in conjunction with other things on the cluster. And that's just an approach that we've taken. And there's other ways that you could, you could uh, architect that. But a really interesting use case from one of our customers, we have a major uh, hedge fund that uses our system. And each one of their data scientists, as they're working on their algorithms, uh, actually implement them as custom frameworks. And depending on how well their algorithm did that day, the, fair, the fairness algorithm is, is tweaked, and they get more compute resources. So the better they rate their algorithm, the better the output they get, the more compute resources they get. So there's kind of like, you know, if you suck at your job, you get no compute resources, and your job never finishes, and maybe you don't work there anymore. So, I thought it was a pretty interesting thing, you know, having your people fight. Like, I could just imagine what those guys are saying to each other. Like, hey, I got 12% of the cluster today. What'd you get? Oh, 8%? Well, that's, uh, that's pretty sad. Um, wow. Anyone know where this is actually plugged in? I got none of the cluster right there. All right, so moving right along. So in the Mesos world, the Mesos slave is actually you know, the, the machine that's going to do all the execution. So you can kind of see the breakdown here in a little closer detail of how the tasks are run. So in a pure Mesos world with Docker, you would have your Docker container. You'd use Marathon to register that. You would say that you need this amount of CPU, this amount of disk, this amount of memory. And the slave that could handle that, running that container, would you know, basically be given that task and say, run this container. So if in our proprietary version with the, uh, our, what we call the Mesosphere Manager, 
you imagine that was your Go app, and you had that inside of a Docker container, you, you launch one, and all of our metrics are exposed via a REST API. So you could write custom, your own custom framework to look at like the inbound traffic to that Go app and decide that, okay, if I get to this threshold, I need one more, two more, three more. And with Marathon, you can actually orchestrate all of those together. So you can say things like, okay, so for every four versions of my you know, Go app running, I need two more Redis servers. And you can orchestrate all of those containers being brought up together. And so we basically map all of those concepts on top of the Kubernetes concepts. And one thing to note with Mesos is you're not stuck with just you know, the Docker container format. You, have, you can run raw tasks. You can see here, like, just kicking off a jar file or a war file you know, directly. Basically, you, know, you could have a bash script that you're kicking off. It doesn't have to be a full-on you know, containered app. So what does Mesos contribute on top of Kubernetes? So you've got the multi-framework, uh, weighted fair sharing roles, preemption, and node drain, which are in development. So one thing to note about our project is this is a top-level Apache project, so you have all of the kind of inherent latency of getting things approved and code reviewed. So what we have running internally versus what's on the review board and waiting for approval, sometimes there can be a bit of a delay. But you know, these concepts are really interesting, the, the preemption and the, and the node drain. So being able to do things like, OK, I want to add more storage to, you know, to these boxes. You can actually go ahead and you imagine you're running MySQL, and you had it running on a, you know, a couple of your slaves, and you wanted to now have you know, three petabytes instead of one petabyte. You'd have to drain the workload off of those, get everything going on something else, add that physical storage, and then bring everything back up. So we're, we basically have a seamless way to do that now. And you can run pods alongside other frameworks, so you could actually have you know, Hadoop running on top of your Mesos cluster, as well as your pods that emulate your, your GC environment. Um, so, you know, Spark, we'll just place Rails with the word Go, uh, Hadoop. And you can run services and batch apps on the same cluster. So we really want to push on that, that the Mesosphere stack is the, you know, OS for the data center, and you don't have to think about individual machines any longer. And a really concrete example of that is at Twitter. Um, so in the past, it would take two, you know, maybe two to two and a half months to bring a new service up. You had to get hardware provisioned. You had to get, you know, all all of the configuration handled, and that would take a long time. You had to go through the whole QA cycle, get things approved. Now you can literally take, you know, a container, get it approved in QA and blessed, and run it on the production cluster within 20 minutes of when you had it approved from QA. So. The other things that Mesos contributes is the advanced scheduling of resources, constraints, and a global view of everything that's happening. So one of our newer advancements in Mesos is the Mesos CLI. So you can actually do things like PS tree against the whole cluster and see what all of your containers and all of your different slaves you know, are doing in one kind of unified view. Um, you have high resource availability and cluster self-healing. So with the different frameworks that we have, we have proprietary frameworks, uh, commercial frameworks from other people, and just community frameworks. And if you look at like the Elastic uh, Search framework, it's really interesting because they, they have that concept of self-healing. So if you've ever had to try to run Elastic Search on your own, you can see like you can pretty easily get into a state where things aren't the greatest, where if you just run it on top of Mesos with that framework, that goes away, and you don't even realize you have problems. And it's proven at scale and battle-tested in production. I mean, if you look at there's two different Fortune 20 companies that I can't name the names of that are, have switched over to a Mesos cluster. And you know, you've got Twitter, Airbnb, Netflix, all these other people using it. Um, so you kind of feel more comfortable with trying it out in your environment, because I doubt you are, I mean, some of you in the room maybe have huge infrastructures. But you know, for the average infrastructure for most startups, it's, it's more than enough. And you know, really concrete use case that, that showcase or case study that showcases that is, uh, you know, HubSpot was spending you know, about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a month uh, in their pre Mesos days on their AWS bill, and they were able to get up and convert all of their services to running on top of Mesos um, in about three months, and their first bill the month after they switched over to Mesos was sixty five percent less than their bill had been traditionally. 
you know, all the months before, and they've actually uh, been able to handle double the amount of traffic than they did before using 30% less resources. And month over month, they keep getting better with that. And, you know, the other thing is just the, having the CLI tools that match the, the GUI. So you're not, you know, if you prefer GUIs, you can have a full GUI experience. If you love CLIs, you can do that as well. So, and does anyone have any questions? I don't want to just keep running through slides. Anything? Nothing? Am I boring? Awesome. <laughs> so, what does Kubernetes contribute? So, pods, you know, tasks to co-locate, -loc co -loc co deploy, isolate, and replicate. Uh, the label service, which is the arbitrary metadata for tasks and pods, which is actually, you know, I mentioned earlier, I think is actually a really cool thing. So, with the attribution system in Mesos, let's say you had you know, pretty much all the same hardware uh, for all of your slaves, but on a couple of them you had some Tesla you know, K40 GPUs in there and you had some Terra sorts that you wanted to do. You could actually use this label service or the attributes in Mesos and um, you know, define that. So you wouldn't launch tasks that don't need GPUs on, on slaves that have GPUs and, and you could target that. Or, if you had really beefy machines, you could apply labels that say, like, these are only for the office of the CTO or only for these special jobs in emergencies. So you could always guarantee that, you know, when your boss's boss's boss needs something done, it runs so speedy, and he talks about how amazing the cluster is. Um, <laughs> and with Kubernetes, you get this tightly integrated service discovery solution. So they've really thought about things at scale at Google and, and how to tie things together. And that's the really critical missing piece just with you know, um, Docker and trying to do the orchestration now is there's no really super solid service discovery. And everyone seems to have a slightly different take on what service discovery means and encompasses. And then the ability to run the Kubernetes API workloads. Um, so this is a horrible slide, and I apologize for how it looks, but you know, I'm not an artist. Um, <laughs> so you can see, you know, and this slide shows GC off in the corner. You've got Hold on a second. Okay. So, you know, you've got the hardware fault tolerance with GCE. With Docker, you've got easy packaging, you know, updates and isolation of your app. Uh, with Mesos, you have the scalability, elasticity, multi tenancy, batch jobs, you know, full utilization of the hardware. And with Kubernetes, you get that high availability of the service discovery and the service ag aggregation. Why is it doing this to me? So this really allows you to have Google-like computing for everyone. So you, know, you can decide to use your whole, your whole cluster. So who here has heard of Google Borg before? OK. So Google is in the process now of moving over to Omega, which is their you know, next generation Borg. And you kind of get the best of, of both worlds uh, with Kubernetes on top of Mesos. So you can do things in the kind of older paradigm. You can architect things a little bit closer to the Omega patterns that, that they're moving towards now. And, you know, just to kind of show some possible stack variations, you can have, you know, Marathon running next to Kubernetes on top of GCE, and it's, you know, Google's hardware and Linux underneath. And one of the things I really like about um, Mesos is that portability. Like, if you think of the, you know, Mesos as a kernel sitting on top of all of your Linux machines, it doesn't really matter to me where those Linux machines are underneath. So if you have everything in Docker containers, you're using Marathon to kick them off. Uh, it doesn't matter to me if you're on AWS, DigitalOcean, GCE, you know, on-premise, because it's all going to work across all of that. So it allows you to do some interesting hybrid you know, solutions. So um, then you just get to basically data, data locality issues. Like, obviously, you don't want to be running something in AWS and accessing data on premise, because uh, it just wouldn't be very performant. So you know, kind of showing another stack variation. Um, you know, other, the other hardware cloud providers, different types of Linux, uh, CoreOS. And you have that portability. There's no vendor lock-in. In the future, we have a strategic relationship with the CoreOS folks, and we're trying to build you know, a better version of CoreOS that works tightly with Mesos. But it really doesn't matter to us as long as you have a modern Linux 
you know, kernel, uh, you can run everything. And in Mesos, we have the concept of isolators. So you could write your own custom isolators, for example. So if let's say you had some secret sauce and you were doing some better, you know, you were the hedge fund and you're doing some better floating point calculations um, utilizing, you know, GPUs, for example, you could actually, you know, implement that at the isolator level and provide that to your services. So these are just some static screenshots to show you what the, you know, Google Cloud Platform with, with Mesos looks like. If you go to google.mesosphere.com, you can go through the process and, and bring up your own cluster. So you just choose the configuration for your cluster if it's development or actually high availability. You can see the costs are, are fairly low, um, but also small instance counts. Um, go through, fill up the forms, and then launch the cluster. It gives you kind of the cost per hour. Uh, I believe we still have credits available for this. So if anyone actually wants to try things out on GC, we can get you a, a $500 credit. So you can, you know, have, you know, in a development environment, 500 bucks will take you a long way when it's $1.68 per hour. Um, so once the cluster is launching, you, you can see, you know, when it's provisioned. Um, then through the, you know, the Google Developer Console, you can see what the boxes are, where they're located, what the external IPs are. Now your cluster is ready to go. Um, you can access it through the cluster VPN using an open VPN client and start to run tasks. So you can see this development cluster you know, it has been up for this amount of time. Nothing's really running on it. So in summary, you can complete, you know, you can build a complete stack for large distributed apps. You ha truly have multi-tenancy and really good resource optimization. And it's easy to deploy with no vendor lock-in. So these are just some links. Um, you know, obviously GCE, Kubernetes, Mesosphere, and then the Kubernetes on Mesos uh, framework, which is still in heavy active development. We have a strategic partnership with Google, you know, to try to provide this. And, you know, obviously being able to run on-premise or even in your own, you know, cloud provider that's not GCE and test things out and, and know that you're doing it in a way that will run really well on GCE is, is pretty powerful for a lot of startups and smaller organizations and some photo credits, because I don't like to just take photos. Um, so at this point, just if anyone has any questions, uh, I'd love to answer them. Yeah, so, you know, like asterisk, the Kubernetes is still pre-production. You know, beta software, it's not, not meant to be used in production. But service discovery for them is very terse in the way that, that they describe it. You're, you're using that labeling system to you know, define what ports, what services are running where, and kind of laying out the whole pattern of what things look like. The, this is my container that's running my Go app. This is my container that's running Redis. These are how they communicate you know, on these ports. And we are probably going to take a little broader approach with service discovery when it comes to, to Mesos. Uh, we've been referring to it as ServiceNet. But we want to give people the ability to actually do more than just define you know, this protocol on this port. Like the ability to have a module from like an intrusion detection vendor and things like that and be able to do packet inspection and look at like the payload. So like even though you're you know, you think you're talking to MySQL to make sure that actually is, you know, that type of data being sent over the wire. Um, if you look at the repo for um, Kubernetes, they have really good walkthroughs of everything, and there's actually a section on service discovery, so you can get really granular details on it. And the, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to email either people at Mesosphere or people at Google, and we can go into it in more detail. And also, since it is, you know, a very actively developed project, opening up an issue, if you see something that doesn't make sense, and getting some of the core developers actually to help you makes a lot of sense. And you know, if you see anything that you think is just maybe a little awkward pattern or wouldn't work in your environment, you know, kind of defining that scenario will help as well to, to shape it to be more what you need. So anyone else have any questions? So you're not really running the task outside of C groups. You're running them outside of the container. So with Mesos, you have this containerizer, and there's just a generic 
containerizer, so you can launch anything that you can run on Linux, you know, that way. So you could have a, a shell script, a, a jar file, you know, whatever you want to run. And we've seen interesting uh, patterns that people do. Like, for example, you know, right now Oracle is not supported inside of any kind of the container formats. But we see people that will take five of their slaves, and that's their Oracle Rack servers, but they still use Marathon to schedule the actual Oracle process running, even though they have all of the prerequisites for Oracle, and they don't try to throw that in a container. So they don't violate their license, but they have the ability to say, you know, if I need to rebalance or I need to do this thing, I can bring up 15 more, you know, to do that and not violate my license as long as I don't go past this, like, time threshold. So, you know, there's no hard constraints of how you can do things. So any other questions? Uh, in the back. So, for example, you, you bring up that cluster, you then, you know, you could either use the marathon scheduling and, and go ahead and you call those REST APIs and, and uh, set up your containers and run there, or you could do it the Kubernetes way through that, that UI. So whatever you would you know, be trying to run, you could bring up. So one of the things we did recently at Mesosphere is we took um, five of our new engineers that were going through the onboarding process, and we put them in a co-working space outside of our office. And we said, you know, pretend you're a new startup and you're trying to bring up what you think is a typical stack, but your only requirements is that you have to use Docker and you have to use Mesos, and it has to work. <laughs> and they went away for three days for this kind of dog fooding exercise and came up with a way to bring everything up. And then we basically took, you know, we tried to break it <laughs> after they showed what they built. And it was pretty amazing to me that, like, these guys are, they were low end, you know, kernel developer type guys. So they, you know, bitched about things that all of us probably are willing to deal with. Like, I can't believe how hard it is to run this Hadoop installer. And it's like, all right, whatever. Um, <laughs> but, they, but they got everything working. And some of the new things that we're adding in Mesos that I'm really excited about is um, some new primitives for stateful apps. So you won't have to do static reservations for things like HDFS. You'll be able to have you know, things like Cassandra, HDFS, MySQL, all running without you having to statically say, like, these are the slaves that will do this. You can actually do it in a much saner way. And it'll probably be Q1 of next year where that's released and, and available. But you know, back to your question, like, whatever you want to run on the cluster, you can. Um, one thing I really like about the GC environment is it seems like the costs are, are pretty low, and getting that $500 credit gives you a good opportunity to play around with things. Um, and in comparison to some of the other you know, providers that we, we have turnkey Elastic Mesos solutions on, the performance seems really great, um, especially if you can get yourself in, on one of the SSD-backed you know, machines. So, Any other questions? Okay. Anyone? None? Okay. No one wanted like, to say I should have made my slides prettier? 